Welcome to the Wycliffe Women of the Word podcast. I'm Jen. And I'm Beth. On today's episode, we're hearing from our friend and author, Leslie Leyland Fields, who's written books such as Forgiving Our Fathers and Mothers, Crossing the Waters, and the Wonder Years. In addition to writing and speaking all over the world, Leslie commercially fishes for salmon off the coast of her home in Kodiak, Alaska. This is one fascinating lady. Since Leslie is a storyteller, we'll be talking with her about how we can break down relational walls and offer grace through our own stories. But before we get into that conversation, Jen, I have a random question for you. Okay. Who would you want to play you in a movie about your life? Ooh, that is a good question. Well, I don't feel like my life is interesting enough to be made into a movie, (laughs) but if it was, I have two requirements. One, it has to be a musical because I feel (laughs) like I just, if my life is going to be made into a movie, it needs to also be musical, which means that I would really love it if Anna Kendrick played me Mm. in a musical movie version of my life. Mm -hmm. She's tiny. She's energetic. She could make it fun and enjoyable. And she has a fantastic voice. There you go. So, yeah, that's, that's about what I've got. So how about you, Beth? Who would you want to play you in a movie about your life? Okay, so my first knee-jerk reaction is Danny DeVito. Um, <laughs> are we like, are we like, is he playing you as a woman or are we like gender bending like this whole scenario? Here? I don't know. He just has the right, like, I don't know, the right ambiance like, about him. Okay. Like he's like short your, your essence. and like he's he awkward. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, he actually. captures that part of you. <laughs> Yeah, no, I actually, we we kind of were on the same wavelength here um, because my thought is Kristen Chenoweth because, yeah, because she's short and, and, and again, I would have to, if my my life was a movie, it would have to be a musical because my life is a musical anyway. So we just very rarely don't have somebody singing in the hallway. Um, (laughs) It's constant. So (laughs) I, I love Chris. I think that that would be hilarious because she also is just like this bubbly personality that I feel like fits Uh really well. Mm -hmm. I feel like they would, I feel like if there was a movie, a a musical movie about both of our lives and like Anna Kendrick and Kristen Chenoweth (laughs) combined forces to do a musical movie based on this podcast. (laughs) That would be like, wouldn't that just be like their powers combined? Like, that would fantastic. be fantastic. That would be a really weird movie. Wouldn't it? It's so pay to go see it too. Like that's the thing. I might like. I know it would be super weird, but I would a hundred percent pay dollars to go see that. Well, there you go. <laughs> Oh, oh my goodness. Oh man. Well, uh speaking of weird and awkward, uh <laughs> and awkwardness and people and uh Let's get awkward, and uh, I'm going to put my radio voice on, because that means it's time for our shameless plug. Traveling around the world usually requires a passport, luggage, and a whole lot of time. But what if you could see beautiful sights, meet incredible people, and journey around the world without leaving your own couch? You can. Wycliffe's travel journal, God in Full View, is an interactive adventure that lets you see the world as we've seen it at Wycliffe. This free, downloadable journal offers recipes, coloring pages, and more, while providing you with amazing photos and stories from countries like Vanuatu, Japan, and Easter Island. Get your journal today at wycliffe.org slash travel. Come and journey with us. And now, on to our conversation with Leslie Leyland Fields.
So this is one of our favorite segments of the show is soul bacon. Arguably, most people really, really love bacon and can not just have one piece of it. Uh, So Beth, uh, what is like bacon to your soul right now? What can't you get enough of? Uh, Right now, it's anything that has ever been recorded by Christy Knuckles. She's Mm. just, I love, I love her voice. I love the way that, um, love the way that she just, the, the lyrics that she, that come from her soul. Um, right now the, the two albums that I'm listening to most are Thrill of Hope, which is technically a Christmas album, but I think is one of those. (laughs) Yes. But it's, it's one that really I listen to year round just because it's so rich. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the other one is be held lullabies for the beloved. Um, Mm -hmm. it's just so just, it sounds, it's like audio peace and rest. And, um, there's just so much truth in it. And my little girl goes to sleep listening to be held every single night. Um, so that's, it's a special album for our family. How about you, Jen? Um, well, my soul bacon is, uh, hilarious because it is exercising, um, but a specific hey. kind of exercising. Um, my roommate actually has a, a bike. Um, and so I am really loving getting a chance to bike ride around the area that I live. Um, because I live near a couple of really nice, like lakes and parks. Um, and you know, when it is quote unquote, Florida cold, um, which means 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, not or, Alaska you know, cold. <laughs> no, not Alaska cold, not like North North Carolina cold. Like Florida cold <laughs> is like that sweet spot of it's under 70. Everyone breaks out their boots and, and scarves. But on days like that, it is just perfect to bike ride. So I really, really can't get enough of just taking the bike out, putting in some worship music or not even putting music on and just like enjoying seeing nature and animals and sights and stuff. So it's just very fun and relaxing. And, um, Mm. it's something I definitely can't get enough of right now and hope, uh, I hope I can continue to do, uh, in the future. So, yeah. How about you, Leslie? What would you say your soul bacon is right now? I, okay. Well, first of all, I have to confess to you, I do not like bacon. So I, so, but I understand the larger metaphor and we're going to go with the larger (laughs) metaphor. (laughs) Maybe we'll change it for you to Uh, soul salmon. Uh, How about that? (laughs) It should be, you should say soul smoked salmon. That's what you should say for me. Yes. Um, Okay. 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 What's your soul smoked salmon? Yeah. So for me, it's, um, it it is exercising It's walking, just getting out and walking in God's creation. Mm. Um, I live in Kodiak, Alaska, and right now I'm sitting in my office. I overlook the ocean and I, and a bald Uh. eagle just flew by, you know, two seconds ago because it's nested right in the tree Uh. above me. And so Uh. I, there are trails all along the ocean and the mountains and uh, all over and that's what I can't get enough of, just soaking in God's presence. And I, uh, I, you know, his, his, the, the sea otters are right out in front and the ducks. And and I just, yeah, I can't get enough of it. it to me, it's mm. just a window into into the, the, the person of God and his, his character mm. and his hospitality and his love. And so, yeah, I feel, I feel like I'm just like strolling mm. through, you know, God's mansions <laughs> when I'm, when I'm going on these walks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just hearing you describe all of that <laughs> just mm-hmm. sounds like, oh, like it's, it, it really is. And and even if it's stormy, I mean, that, that's, that's part yeah. of God's nature too, you know, and, and just to feel yeah. that power and, um, it really, mm-hmm. I, I do just so strongly feel the presence of God. Mm-hmm. Oh, I've seen awesome. pictures that you've posted and it just, I was telling Jen earlier that, Alaska's on my, my bucket list. I don't know if and when it'll happen, but it's Same. just, 
we're so always here. We're just not. It's just a few plane rides away. You know, <laughs> <laughs> we've okay, maybe yeah, I we've got friends one. in Australia, Alaska. Mm-hmm. I think we need to just take this podcast on the road. We need to do a really. Tour. I'm hearing. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Okay, that's what's happening. That's what's happening. World <laughs> tour, beautiful places, right. exploring God's creation. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> Done. <laughs> oh. Yes. So, so Leslie, living in a place like Alaska, I know has been really rich, um, rich fodder for you, for the things that you write. Um, Mm -hmm. And I know we've, we've talked before um, and I've um, read enough of your, enough of your writing to know that story is something that is really incredibly important to you. Um, how did you discover for yourself the value of telling your story? Yeah, and it what you know it this a there's a yeah I could take like a week you know to answer that question. I'm going to try to <laughs> press it down sort of the the you know major sort of turning points. I started writing really early. You know, as soon as I could write, um, I got a Mother Goose book for Christmas and I, I just started memorizing those poems and with the rhythms and the rhymes and it really got language mm. in my head and the beauty and the fun and the play of, of language. Mm. And so I, I mm. wrote poetry all through my childhood. And then in, um, in high school, you know, when, when my, our, our family life started getting really, really difficult, um, I, writing became very much a form of, of therapy. I think it was a, a way of saying, um, a, a way of being heard, even to myself, um, when mm-hmm. when you felt very invisible and very small, and when the, all this chaos and rage and upheaval and poverty and all this stuff is going uh, uh, going on around you, to be able to put words on the page that stayed there and that helped to name what was happening that truly was a lifeline for me um mm-hmm. so later and so I, I got married and and moved to Alaska at the ripe old age of 20 and and this was my <laughs> this is my new life now my new world and I promptly jumped right into commercial fishing with my husband and, um, and that life was so intense and we're out in small boats, out on stormy oceans and doing crazy work 16 hours a day, you know, just, uh, there was no room for story. There was no room for, there's no space for poetry. And I would just kind of try to sneak it in. I would literally write poems on my pocket, stick them in my, hmm. on a piece of paper and stick them in my pocket. And when we were, uh, mending that, I would, on a deadline, I'd pull out this poem and it would feed me. It would just feed my soul. Mm-hmm. Um, but that next step, but and, and this was this was poetry, but this was not my story. And it wasn't until years later mm-hmm. to my 30s when I began to um, write about other women's stories, women in commercial fishing. That was my first book. Um I saw every. I thought everyone else had a much better story than I did. They were, and so I didn't want to write about my life and my story. And besides that, I was really scared to do that. It's how do you write about a story that you're in the middle of, and how do you write about your childhood when all of your family is still living and <laughs> may not want want you to talk about it? So they're like all these minds, you know, sort of minds by land and minds by sea. But my, um, it was actually my editor um, who really pushed me into telling my stories. And uh, she had a collection of essays that I had written about my life out in fishing and out on this wilderness island in Alaska. And she said, uh, Leslie, essays essays don't sell. And uh, by the way, you're not in them. And I said, well, of course not. I don't want these, these are not stories about me. They're stories about the wilderness and fishing and, you know, all these other exciting things, bald eagles. And, and, um, and she said, no, we, we, I mean, they're great, but we want your story. 
And she said, you need to turn this into a memoir and it needs to be your story. And my first response was, <laughs> was, uh, no, I can't do that. And I hung up. And, um, it was a, a couple of weeks later, I was teaching, I was a English professor at the time, and I'm, I'm teaching a creative writing class. And I'm, I'm standing up there in front of my students and I'm saying to them, if you want to grow as a writer, you have to tackle new genres, new things that you've never done before. You know, you have to write stuff you're scared to write. And I like almost stopped mid-sentence and heard myself and I thought oh my goodness this is for me <laughs> and so I called my uh, called my editor back and said okay I'll do it and um and so that that book ended up being a memoir just a, a full-on all-out memoir of my life um pieces of my life growing up and then my life in fishing and out in the Alaskan wilderness and but I have to tell you it was scary to take that step kind of um, to unlock that yeah. door into my own experiences and thoughts and feelings and things that were hard, um, hard to write about. But someone else made me do it. <laughs> and actually, it changed the whole course of my writing life. As you've learned to tell your own story, you're also um, encouraging other people to tell their stories. Um, why is that? And how has telling your story brought you into a place where you can share um, that journey with other people? Yeah. And it's, you know, it's, it's definitely, it, it wasn't an overnight thing, but I need to say too, is that it, I worked eight years on that memoir um, because yeah. that, you know, I was tasked with kind of what is the story of your life and you have to figure out what, what, what one story here am I going to tell? But I, but Beth and the, the amazing thing that happened, and this is why it really was a, a conversion experience, you know, writing memoir, writing my life story was, it was a conversion experience. Um, and mm -hmm. that book alone, my first memoir, it helped me, it helped me find God in places in my memory where I hadn't seen him before. It helped me understand a lot of what had happened um, in my family as I was growing up and in the early years of fishing and in my marriage. It it gave me compassion for my husband and for my parents. And the words that I found for that story actually created home for me. It turned a wilderness mm -hmm. into home. Those words carved home out of some very hard memories. And mm -hmm. um, I saw the power of language. We know that, you know, God used words to to speak the world. He could have just used breath. He could have used thought. He mm -hmm. could have, you know, think of all the other ways that he could have created, but he chose to use words. And then he invited Adam into, into the, uh, the, the naming of the world, you know, Adam, you name the animals, you join me in this. And, and I think that's, uh, that's the task that is, that still is given to us, um, every day, each one of us to name the world that, that is, that is whirling and, and spinning around us and to name our lives and to name who God is and where he's been and what he's done mm. uh, and all of that. Mm -hmm. There's something super powerful about being able to put a name to something that you're going through or a name to something that you've gone through or just a name to your own story. That's, that's, there's so much power in that. So yeah, that's, there that's, really is. And we, you know, our lives, um, I don't know what your lives look like, um, ladies, but I have a guess that they probably look a lot like mine, which is like, you know, the alarm goes <laughs> off and our, our feet hit the floor and we lace up our running shoes and we are blasting through our days. Um, Mm -hmm. We're raising children. We have work and jobs. We have ministry responsibilities at church mm -hmm. and in our communities. And, and we're living life at this breakneck speed. And what writing does, 
writing just just makes us stop. We have to stop. We have to sit mm-hmm. down. Or we we don't always have to sit down. I can do it when I'm standing up sometimes. <laughs> but we have to stop, pause, and and catch yeah. our breath. And it is this turning behind and looking and maybe we're just turning behind and looking at what happened in the just that morning or maybe we're looking at something that happened 50 years ago but it's that opportunity um to seek god and to find him Mm -hmm. and um and 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 to listen and i think a lot of people think that Mm -hmm. writing is simply recording what we know but -hmm. writing Mm -hmm. is actually a form of paying attention it's a Mm -hmm. form of prayer it's a form of seeking God. And I think we can learn to write in such a way that, um, that, that we're, we're, we're holding our hands out. You know, Jesus invites us to ask, mm-hmm. seek, and knock. And that's what writing is. Mm-hmm. Writing can be, is this yeah. invitation. Um, we're asking, we're seeking, and we're knocking. And we're asking for wisdom. We're asking to, um, we're seeking the presence of God. We're seeking understanding because our lives are, are messy and hard and complex. And we don't get mm-hmm. half of what's going on. And so writing gives us an opportunity to um, to ask questions of God and to and to find meaning and to find significance mm-hmm. and find purpose and all mm-hmm. that we're doing. Stories, I think, really, I don't know, they stick in our memories a lot more easily than facts or, you know, analysis or recitation mm-hmm. of lists. Um, and they help us kind of, you know, have hooks to hang things on in understanding concepts. Um, what are some of the ways that, that you've seen? in scripture, how it utilizes, how God utilized the format of story through scripture. Yeah. I mean, the Old Testament is mostly story, Mm -hmm. right? And, Mm -hmm. um, and, and, those stories, they, they they fit the classic definition of story, which is, well, well, here's my two word definition of story. Something happens, right? A story, something mm. happens. Mm. And so we have all these events, we have characters, we have setting, we have dialogue, we have plot, we, you, you know, you can follow the whole arc of, of plot, you've got conflict and rising action, and falling action and denouement. And it's, you know, it's all there. And, and God gave and I love that I love that he gave us his word, his own story, his redemption narrative, I love that he gave it to us in story, because we can enter into it, then not just with our, our brains, this is not primarily mm-hmm. a cerebral intellectual activity. It is the stories speak to us whole person, whole body. It engages mm-hmm. our, our, yes, our mind, our intellect, but also our emotions, our feelings, our bodies. There's all of these sensory details um, so that we can, when we're reading these stories in scripture of Ezekiel in the, in the Valley of Dry Bones, right? We can see it. Mm-hmm. We can hear it. We can feel it. There are all these images and and these, um, you know, the, can you imagine? You, we can. We can imagine that Ezekiel's standing there and these thousands of bones and suddenly bo- the bones are rattling and joining together and the skin's coming on. We can, we can see all of that because God uh, gave us a word that is so vivid and, and, and bright and, and compelling. Um, so, you know, that's enough of a reason right there yeah. for, to, for us mm-hmm. to embrace story is that God, God clearly wired us for story and he gave us his word yeah. and story format. So we know that there's something that's very special um, about story. Yeah. yeah. I love that too. I love the scripture tells us that the God's word is a, a living and active and that's totally what story is. Story is alive. It comes alive and it makes yeah. us come alive when we engage with it, which is just the beauty and seeing 
you know, in seeing scripture, it's, it's a bunch of stories and it's one story and it's different kinds of, it's poetry, it's imagery, it's, yeah. it's those words, you know, it, I don't know, like I've, I've read scripture before where I've been like, those were the words that I've wanted to, like, those are the words mm-hmm. that's been in my heart. Like, that's mm-hmm. it. That's it, God. That's my prayer. And it's, it's in scripture. Um, and there's, there's beauty. There's so much like beauty in understanding that there are so many different kinds of story. And then to see right. the overarching redemptive story, it's just, right. it's powerful, you know? It and it's is. like, it is. Uh, even, even though, even though people, even if people don't believe in, in scripture or God or the Bible, you see there that there's this longing for that story throughout our entire, you know, world and our society. They, they want, the stories of redemption and you see like in popular culture, so many different elements of God's story are just echoed. Um, and it's this, this longing for, you know, the, the story of God, um, right. which is just so beautiful. So beautiful. It really is. And, you know, I think if we, when we look at the stories in the scriptures too, I mean, um, we we often as Christians we we think that if we're writing story that it's going to be um, you know it's going to be redemptive and there's always going to be a lift at the end it's going to you know have a clear plot line it's always going but you know that is that's not the New Testament that's not the Old Testament that is not the Old Testament the Old Testament is messy and I don't mm-hmm. like some of those stories. <laughs> but here's the thing about them. And I think when we figure out, okay, what do we learn about storytelling from the Bible? Mm-hmm. I think the number one thing that we learn is our stories have to tell the truth. That's the mm-hmm. number one yeah. thing. And yeah. we look at, you know, the story of David, one of the, one of the, um, you know, prominent um, characters of the Old Testament. Now, if I had been the editor of David's story, there are some pieces I would have just left out, right? Mm-hmm. That's Sheba yeah. and, you know, and um, Uriah and the and, murder, and, and the, the, mur- <laughs> the murder. And then how about, now. <laughs> and how about all the lives? It's Solomon's story too, you yeah. know, Solomon's story. Mm-hmm. His story yeah. ends with... With that verse that says, you know, something like, you know, at the end of his life and Solomon's heart was turned. Mm. He he did not follow God the way his, Mm. um, the way David had his, his wives turned his heart, you know, after, after other gods. And I think about Mm. God as the editor of these stories (laughs) and he chose to leave those pieces in because they're Mm. true. And mm-hmm. I, I think that's a really important lesson for us as we write our mm-hmm. stories from our lives that we are, in, we are I'm going to say even more than invited, we are commanded to, to tell mm-hmm. the truth, whether no matter how mm-hmm. messy and complex and complicated yeah. um, it is. And I think about Ecclesiastes, the... Um, which, which is a book I love to talk about messy. Uh, um, in, in chapter three, there's that whole, um, that whole poem about, you know, a time to, uh, it's basically a catalog of human experience. You know, there's a time to love and a time to hate. There's a time for, uh, war and a time for peace there's a time to gather stones and a time to scatter stones there's a and that's that's I think that's a framework of our lives and every one of us can look at every one of those categories and say oh yeah this was a time in my life when I was gathering stones and this is a time when I was scattering and this is a time when I was at war and this is a time when I was at peace and this is when I hated and this is when I loved and I think when we look into our lives that it's important to tell the full, the full story. Um, God wasn't afraid to, to tell the full, ugly, messy slash beautiful story of his people. And we shouldn't be afraid either. Mm. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I learned and, and really came to love, um, we lived in Papua New Guinea for a, a little bit a few years ago and um, their main community activity that they do at the end of every day, they come together. Um, it's still a very developing nation. There aren't a lot of uh, areas that have readily available electricity. Um, and so life is still very slow paced. 
in most of these places in, in Papua New Guinea. And each night, um, they would come together around a fire, um, usually as uh, family groups, and sit around and do what they call storying, that it's actually a verb, that story is more than mm, just a noun mm. in PNG. It's, it's yeah. a verb. You, so, you story with people. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I loved yeah. how that, just the act of storying together, and they would do everything from talk about the day and what happened and what funny things happened. And, you know, when, whenever, when, when we were living in the village that we lived in for our training for a month, we usually were the topic of the storying <laughs> at, at night. <laughs> Did you see how that crazy woman fell down in the mud again? <laughs> but <laughs> I'm sure that we're probably still legendary. Isn't that good? Doesn't it make you feel good that you can make somebody... Yeah. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. I covered oh, yeah. you up. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, um, yeah. So I loved, I loved the fact that the, the act of storying together was a community building experience. It was a relationship building experience. Even when we know how valuable it is to tell our stories, um, it can feel a little bit intimidating, I think. And especially the parts that are awkward or messy. Um, what would you tell people who are struggling um, with the idea of how to figure out how to begin telling their stories, especially those awkward and messy parts? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think one of the most important, first I want to say, um, I, I think a lot of us, we might know, you know, in our head, know intellectually that our Mm -hmm. story matters, that our stories matter. But, um, I know for a long time that I struggled with writing my story because I thought, who am I? You know, like I, I'm not, I'm not an important person. I haven't done anything grand. And I think we have to have even, you know, some really dramatic conversion story. Like, you know, I used to run with hell's angels and now I'm planting orphanages (laughs) in Africa, you know, and, and instead most of us, you know, have pretty ordinary lives. And so you think, well, what, you know, does, does my story even matter? And I'm, and I want to just, I want to speak to those people because, um, a lot of them show up even in my writing workshops. Um, they're there because they want to write their story, but they're, but they're really not quite convinced that, um, that their story is important. So I'm going to, I'm talking Mm -hmm. to all of you people out there (laughs) and I want to, I'm going to give you a few reasons that are right straight from the scriptures. Okay. So that means you can't argue back with me about this, (laughs) Uh, but, but um, one of the reasons that you need to, to write your story is that your life and your life story is not, it's not yours. It's not your own, you know, to keep or claim as your own and everything that has come to you, um, you know, all the, the, the tragedies and the blessings and, and the children and, and the jobs and um, all these things that have come to you have come to you, not just for yourself, but for other people as well. And we know that verse in, in 2 Corinthians that, that says, and this is a long passage, I won't give the whole passage, but talks about God comforting us in all of our troubles. And why does he do that? So that we can comfort those in any trouble with a comfort we ourselves receive from God, just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ. So also our comfort abounds through Christ. And we see that throughout the, um, throughout the New Testament, that these things come to us for this, that we may be able to serve others. So mm-hmm. that's one of the, th- one of the things that our stories, um, our, our, our stories do. And uh, another is that, and this is a very natural um, outgrowth of that, is our stories create community and strengthen the body mm-hmm. of Christ. And um, our, when we tell our stories and we invite other people to tell their stories, and there's this incredible passage in um, 1 John that that speaks to this about strengthening the body of Christ. And the, the First John opens with this, this paragraph, and we, we probably all know the paragraph, um, you know, that which was from the beginning, which we've heard and seen and, and touch with our hands. And it goes on with all of these sensory words. Again, we've seen, we've 
t- we've heard it. We we pro- we're proclaiming this to you what we have seen and heard. And then the end of that paragraph, he says, um, "We write this to make our joy complete." Hmm. So here's this here's this amazing thing that this this uh, writer John has been in the presence of Jesus, has experienced all of this stuff, but his joy isn't complete Mm. until he passes it on, until he writes it down and passes on and proclaims what he has seen and heard and and, and touched with his hands. So it's the same for us, right? Haven't we all seen and heard something of Jesus in this life? Mm. And we we need to write it so that out write it and pass it on and enter into fellowship with our hearers with our audience and together we enter into fellowship with with God the Father as we write and pass on our stories yeah. so there's this incredible triangular community that's formed when we write our stories and pass them on to one another mm. Yeah, absolutely. You have a, a really good resource that um, has just been released, and I would love to hear a little bit more about that. I'd love for you to share that with our listeners. Yeah, and that's um, that's why I'm so I, I'm so um, excited about this <laughs> material. Um, my next book, it's my twelfth book, um, is coming out um, very soon. Will we'll have just been released, and it's called "Your Story Matters: Finding, Writing, and Living the Truth of Your Life." And this is a, a book that's really the fruit of about 30 years of my own writing life, as well as teaching writing. I've been teaching mm-hmm. writing um, all over the world. And I mean, in a prison in South Africa and in and, and, um, and, and living rooms and graduate classrooms and senior centers. I mean, just everywhere. And so I've taken what I think is the most um, essential and most inspiring and helpful um, material. And it will help every person to kind of walk. I will take them through this process, this writing process to, um, to look into their lives, to, to testify and proclaim to what they have seen and heard and to present, um, to present their life in, in beautiful, compelling, truthful stories that will give glory to God. And, and yes, they, and they'll be messy and they'll, they won't be perfect and they won't, you know, end with a, with a, um, you know, a a rainbow necessarily. But um, this is, this is what we're doing. We write this to make our joy complete, to pass on all, all that God is and who he is and what he has done in our lives. So I'm I'm excited. This is going to be a resource for churches and for groups to come together. There's a DVD, an eight part video series that comes with it too. So I yeah, I'm just really excited to, to see how God is going to use this in the church and and beyond. Yeah, absolutely. That's We're awesome. Excited. We're excited too. Final question. We like to. Um, call it soul dessert, you know, because we start with soul bacon. <laughs> so we've got to end with soul dessert. Yeah, end with dessert. You know. <laughs> Never mind the in-between stuff. I mean, that, I who know. cares? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so like, you know, the interview, the interview and discussion <laughs> is like, is like dinner and it's like the richness and then you yeah. got to oh, end with Oh, you're like right. The meat, right? That's right? the meat <laughs> and yes. potatoes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. yes. And then we <laughs> end... We have to end with with dessert because, you know, it's a celebration and it's a feast and scripture is a celebration and mm-hmm. a feast. And mm-hmm. um, so first, we'd like to hear what your favorite dessert is. Oh, that's such an impossible question. And I'm going to be like, you know, 99% of all women and say anything with chocolate in it. So it, it needs to be chocolate and mm-hmm. it needs to be warm. And that oh. means there also probably needs to be ice cream involved um, oh, on top of it. Yes. And if it's a, if it's a chocolate lava cake, you know, with ice cream on top. Okay. I, yep. That's, um, that's right on the list. All yes. right. <laughs> Oof, that's amazing. Sounds mm. amazing. Yes. There yeah. mm-hmm. one of the things that we like to do is um make a monster cookie, which is basically okay. a a batch of chocolate chip cookie dough. You throw it in a cast yeah. iron skillet 
and you bake it and then you pull it out. And while it's still warm, you put ice cream Mm. and whipped cream on top of it and hand everybody a spoon and they just dig in. (gasps) Oh my goodness. I love that. And a skillet too. Iron skillets are like my favorite, Uh, mm -hmm. favorite pan, cooking pans. Oh my goodness. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, honestly, chocolate is the best. Anything like you're saying, warm chocolate, like warm chocolate. Yeah. Warm chocolate. Yeah. Right. There's just something. All melty. So good. Uh-huh. Uh, I'm about to go. I'm just gonna go find chocolate now. I'm like, okay, right. I know that's what I'm doing. It. Let's hurry up. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's conversation, but also chocolate. <laughs> so important. Okay, so yeah. as you're thinking about that feeling that is produced when you've got that chocolate lava cake, what scripture right now is like that for your spirit that gives you that feeling of satisfaction? Yeah, I, um, so I have a prayer journal and I, um, I actually write down all kinds of things besides prayers. I I write down passages of scripture that really speak to me. And, um, I find, so half of my prayer journal is, is just scripture, but there's a passage in second Timothy one, six that I love. And I'm just kind of holding on to right now as, um, as I begin a new ministry and as your story matters goes out into the world. And here's, here's what it says. It says, fan into flame the gift of God. For God mm. did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, of self-discipline. Mm. And... Um, I, I do a lot of travel and I do a lot of things that scare me. And I think, well, Lord, what am I doing? You know, just before I'm about to go on stage or I'm about to do this or that. And, and I return to this verse, fan into flame, the gift of God. God has given this gift, use it. And, and, mm-hmm. and then it says, you know, he didn't give us a spirit of timidity, a spirit of power, and and love and love is so powerful isn't it and that's mm-hmm. that's what yeah. that's what drives me onto a stage in front of a microphone like even at this moment love um mm-hmm. and self discipline which means keep going keep going Leslie don't don't quit so that's that is food yeah. that, that is such food mm-hmm. yeah that's it's not quite the chocolate lava cake maybe that's the ice cream on top <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> mm. oh, yes, I love that. Good. Oh. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Leslie. We really, really appreciate um, you just speaking so much truth. I feel like I just learned and absorbed so much from you that I need to go like resonate and, and really like reflect on over some chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean the, the whole the whole conversation about story it's huge yeah. and we've just touched on it but yeah. um but it's it's provocative, it's evocative mm-hmm. and I you know I want to leave people with yes, fan into flame the gift of God and part of the gift of God is what he has given you in your life, all that he has given to you, all the experiences from the really hard to the really beautiful. Those are all gifts from God and when we sit down and begin to write into our stories, we, we, we begin to unpack it in new ways mm-hmm. and discover, wow, look what, look what God has entrusted to me. And I need to, mm-hmm. I need to pass this on to others. Thanks for listening to the Wycliffe Women of the Word podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast wherever you and all the other cool kids happen to get your podcasts these days. You can keep up with our content by following Wycliffe Bible Translators USA on social media and by visiting wycliffe.org women. We'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.